Brother Chris, uh, staying in contact with Miss Carol, and uh, Mr. Talmadge, his father-in-law, um, has obviously has some sort of infection, and so uh, he's not able to come home from the hospital yet. So uh, she's been there for some time now. They need to swap vehicles, and there's a lot of things, a lot of logistical things that are going on right now. So Brother Chris made the decision to drive to Huntsville uh, this evening. So uh, you keep him in your prayers, please, and, and, uh, and we'll just say a prayer for him right now. Let's do that. Our Father, we just ask that you would bless our brother Chris as he travels. Lord, be with Miss Carol as she ministers to her family. And Father, that your love and your peace, your grace would overshadow everything that takes place, Father. Thank you for Mr. Talmadge. Thank you that he knows you, um, that he's in your hands. Lord, he's in the safest place he can be. But we do ask that you would bring healing to him, that you would remove this infection, that you'd bring him home from the hospital so he can be returned to his family, Lord. And we will give you the credit and the glory for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, the book of James, wonderful, practical book. It's going to get really practical tonight. Uh, so, uh, go ahead and find your Bible if it's lost. If you don't know where it is, find it. I don't know why I say find your Bible. Um, but maybe you brought it and you sat on it or you put it under the pew or something. Go ahead and open up your Bible or your, uh, your app on your phone. James chapter 4. And beginning in verse 13, we'll read on down through into chapter 5 tonight, but we'll just begin with the very first part, and we're going to talk about godly business. And James has walked us through the Christian response to every relationship that we have, basically, up to this point. He's talked about uh, how we ought to love one another in the church, and we give our faith feet and come to the rescue of the needy, he talks about how the church ought to relate to one another and how we ought to relate in our own homes uh, as Christians. And now James is going to shift gears and he's going to talk about faith in the marketplace. Godly business. James dispenses with the idea that faith in God should stay in the church or in your home. There's a lot of Christians out there that they're uh, Christians in the closet. They're anonymous Christians. You wouldn't know that they're really a Christian because they don't talk about their faith. They just go, go along and they get along and they keep their head down in the business world so that they can keep their jobs, so that they can uh, not offend people, not be offensive, not proselytize in the marketplace. But James says that's not how Christians should live. James tells us that our faith should inform our business, everything that we do. So here's the truth. Um, we back up and hit the biblical truth for just a moment. Christians must walk by faith in both the holy place and the marketplace. Let me say that one more time again. Christians must walk by faith in both the holy place and the marketplace. I mean, we want our church to be a holy place. And we want to walk and talk by faith in the church. Amen? That's right. We need to. I mean, we need to encourage one another in the faith. We need to build one another up. And we need to talk about the Lord and what He's done. We need to share the gospel with one another in Sunday school and in song and in preaching. And it strengthens us as Christians to come to church. And we need to walk by faith into this building and gather together. But we also need to walk by faith in the marketplace as well when we're out and about. We want our homes to be those holy places as well. And we can talk about Jesus as long as we're inside, but when we walk down the street or we go to the marketplace, we go to work, this includes uh, our places of business, our workplaces, the places where we do our buying and our selling. If we own a business, that's in our own personal business. If we have a small business or maybe we're an employee and we have lots of employers or maybe we are an employee, uh, maybe we're an employer and we have lots of employees or maybe we are the one employed in our investments, where we put our money, the things that we purchase in our politics and how we talk about politics on Facebook or whatever outlet you have, voting. The way we vote in, and I, I'm not going to tell you in a couple of weeks where you, how you need to vote. When, what date is that? Let me just remind everybody what date it is. 
November 3rd? Well, yeah, but we've got, we've got the primary coming up on the 18th. So don't forget to vote. I'll just put it that way. But you need to vote according to your Christian convictions. All right? When you go to Walmart and you're in the checkout line, yeah, or you're in the Walmart parking lot trying to get into Walmart, you know, sometimes we don't act very Christian in those places. And so James tells us that our faith should inform our business actions and we should walk by faith in both the holy place and the marketplace. So let's listen to what he has to say. Read with me in verse 13 of chapter 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Notice he's, he's talking, this is obviously a business venture and they're about to go and invest. They're going to invest time and money and capital and they're going to go to another town to do this. So it's a, it's, it's just a risky business. Okay, so they're going to they go in, they're going to go in together and do this partnership and this business venture in verse 14. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let's keep going. Chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Ooh, that doesn't sound nice. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the, the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the days of slaughter, in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Let us uh, pray. Father, that... Uh, now you would add understanding to the reading of your word. And Father, faithfulness to obey all that you command us. We want to be the people that live by faith. Whether we're here or whether we're there. No matter who we're with. Father, that you would find us faithful in all things. To the glory of your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, so I want us to be... In our business, I want us to receive from the Lord a triple A rating. So my outline tonight, I've got three A's, okay? Uh, number one, godly business affirms God's sovereignty. Affirms God's sovereignty. When we think about sovereignty, a, someone who is a sovereign is a king. They're in charge. They're in authority. They rule over. And so we think about this. We... We think about that phrase, Lord willing. Well, where did that come from? We say, Lord willing, Lord willing. do you say that? Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Do y'all ever say that? I had, had a gentleman uh, that went to Fairday uh, Church, where I came from, to come here. And he used to always say, Lord, say the same. You know, and then what that means is, if the Lord says the same thing I say, then this will happen. But he just shortened it, you know, uh, Concordia Parish slang, Lord say the same. And, uh, and so that's what he'd always throw in there. Lord say the same, I see Sunday. Lord say the same, I see Sunday. And so I knew exactly what he meant. He said, Lord willing, we'll get back together and we'll, we'll be back together we'll have church. But here's what that acknowledges. And this is what James is teaching us. We need to acknowledge in all of our dealings, everything that we do in our business, we need to acknowledge humanity's lack of control. Amen? Lack of control. I mean, I look at 2020 and I think, what is a 2020 calendar? What is that? You look at a 2020 calendar with me, it looks like a nightmare. 
That's what it looks like. You flip the pages and it looks like a nightmare. If you don't remember, just the beginning of 2020, we started out with the worst wildfires in Australia's history. That was the first thing, okay? And then not long after that, we were dealing with, uh, in January, Janu early in January, tensions with Iran escalating the death of Soleimani. You remember that? We thought we might go to war with Iran at the beginning of January. And then, and then in February, two articles of impeachment against our president. You know, splitting the nation about all of this stuff uh, that's happening against President Trump. March the 16th, 15 days to slow the spread. And then April rolled, out, uh, rolled around and it was like, April Fool's, you're stuck inside. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you know, 15 days, yeah, whatever. How many days has it been since we've been dealing with coronavirus? I mean, and then May 25th, the death of George Floyd, tragic death of George Floyd, uh, that sparked uh, in June and July riots and unrest, protest, a, a, a sovereign uh, state, within um, Seattle. What, what, what in the world is going on around us? I mean, how many of us would have thought in 2019 we'd be looking at 2020 and the calendar would look like this? I mean, whoever invested money in uh, restaurant what supplies... I mean, they made a terrible investment, didn't they, this year? My prediction is if they don't open schools, we're going to see a lot more riots and unrest. But here's the thing. I don't know. Can you just say that with me? I don't know. We don't know, do we? And what James is confronting is this assertion in our business ventures, that we truly know what's going to happen. Because we don't. It's all just speculation, really. It all is. When we try to control the world around us and not acknowledge that some things are simply beyond our scope of control, what we're doing is we're telling God, we've got it covered. I don't need you. And that's what we say to God. And so these people, they don't acknowledge their own inability to even control their very lives. So what does James say? He says, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The word is vapor, or uh, in the, in the uh, Greek language is atmos, and then in the Hebrew language is the word hevel. It's the word that comes up over and over again in Solomon's writing in wisdom literature is this word hevel. What is hevel? Hevel is vapor or mist. Have you seen these people uh, that, and maybe, maybe some of you might have, have uh, enjoyed a puff every once in a while on one of these vapes. They're having lots of trouble with the teenagers using them nowadays. Uh, because they have lots of, they still have lots of nicotine in them, and they still can damage your lungs and all this stuff. But it's an alternative to a cigarette. But you've seen that. You've seen the vapor that comes out of that. It just, it comes out. It, it looks like a big puff, some uh, some substantive cloud. But then a few, just a few seconds later, guess what? It's gone. It only lasts for a second. And this is what James is reminding us of. That's our life on this earth. That's your existence as a human being. It only lasts for a moment, and then it's gone. And so, James is saying that godly business acknowledges humanity's lack of control. It acknowledges the one who is in control. So James reminding, reminds us that all of our planning must be submitted to God. What is your life? Are you a midst that appears for a little time and then vanishes? In verse 15, instead, instead, this is the attitude that you should have, not that I'm in control of the situation, not that I know what's going to happen, but instead I ought to say, if the Lord wills, Lord willing. 
And now James doesn't quantify or qualify when and where and how we ought to say if the Lord wills. It's almost as if I have this attitude that if the Lord wills, we'll make it through Wednesday night prayer meeting. If the Lord wills, I'll go home and get something to eat. If the Lord wills, I'll get up in the morning and I'll take a shower and come back to work. If the Lord wills about everything. Why? Because it's all contingent upon His sovereignty. It's His will that will prevail, not mine. And so in the very first place, that very first A is godly business affirms God's sovereignty. Proverbs 16 and verse 3 says this, Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Commit your work to the Lord. So the question is, does the Bible teach us not to plan? Because, you know, if the Lord wills everything, I should never plan anything. No. That's not what it says. The Bible says commit your work to the Lord. In other words, I'm going to do what God says no matter what. And I'm going to follow Him no matter what. And my plans will be submitted to Him. They'll always be contingent upon His will. And if somewhere down the road my plans don't work out, it's because I was not in the will of God. Somehow. And now His will for me is this, rather than this. And I'll continue to follow Him. So commit my work to the Lord, and my plans will be established. Hudson Taylor had, a, a defi had definite convictions about how God's work should be done. He said, we can make our best plans and try to carry them out in our own strength. Or we can make careful plans and ask God to bless them. Then he said, yet another way of working is to begin with God, to ask His plans, and to offer ourselves to Him to carry out His purposes. And that's the way a Christian should operate. Affirming God's sovereignty. Secondly, godly business abides by God's statutes. When I say statutes, I'm talking about His rules, His commands, his precepts, those are his statutes. That's a good biblical word. And I'm not talking about those things that they're trying to tear down all over the place. I'm not talking about statues. Statutes. Established truth. That's God's statutes. And so godly business abides by that. So look at what it says next. He says in verse 16, As it is, you boast in your arrogance. Well, what is arrogance? Arrogance is thinking that I know more than I know, or I am more than I am. It's thinking highly of myself. And so I'm arrogant whenever I think I know what I don't know. I'm arrogant about that. And he says, all such boasting is evil. Evil. And so I'm evil if I decide I'm going to do things my way and the world's going to go my way rather than God's way. And then in verse 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. And so we can study this for just a moment. There are sins, okay, of commission. And one of those sins that he mentions that's evil, he says, is boasting and arrogance. I mean, you are committing sin against God when you boast. And you think that you know what you don't know. Or you act like you know what you don't know. Alright? But then there's sins of omission. And those sins of omission are, there is something that God has called us to do. There are plans that God has called us to make. There is work that God wants each and every one of us to do. But if we allow our plans and our work and our desires to overshadow what God wants for our lives, and we neglect the thing that He's called us to do, now what have we done? We've sinned. The word is armatia. Armatia means to miss the mark. To leave something undone. To fail, in other words. So we have failed. We've missed the mark. Because God is calling us to His will, and He's calling us to do it, to keep it. And we've missed the mark. I think about this verse a lot. I mean, man, isn't that a strong verse? 
Verse 17. To him who knows the good thing they ought to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. Wow, doesn't that cover so many things? You know, whenever I think about it, I think about it whenever I'm in a public restroom. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I do. I don't know why. I think about when I'm in a public restroom, especially now in the days of COVID. And I wash my hands. And uh, I, I get my, my hand towel, the paper towel. And I dry my hands. And I go to the door. And I usually take the paper towel with me to open the handle of the door. Uh, to open the door with the handle with the towel in my hand so I don't touch the handle of the door. But then the trash can's over there. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Okay, I prop the door with my foot. Ball the, ball the paper towel up. Anybody, any of you guys do this? Oh, I missed. And what I, now I have a decision to make. And this verse pops in my head every single time. I never can just leave the bathroom. There's somebody that can clean that up later. Nope. Him who knows the good that he ought to do, and he does not do it, to him it is sin. So I go, oh. Thanks, James. Pick it up, throw it in there. Touch the handle anyways. And uh, and that's what I, I think about. But I, I think about this when we apply this to the context in our business world. In the business world. There is something good. Listen. Don't miss this. Because maybe as you sit in this place, you've been missing this for 50 years. You could be. There is something good that God has called you to do in that secular world out there. He's calling you to be salt and light in the world. And I want to tell you, it's not too late. It's not too late for you to take up the task and work with all your might with all the strength that you have in the good thing that God has called you to do. And I will tell you this, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. Whatever it is that God has called you to do. You know the good you ought to do, do it with all your might, do it with all your heart. If you don't know the good that you ought to do, get in the Word, get in prayer, spend time with the Lord and seek the Lord. Take your occupation and lay it at the feet of God. Whatever that is. If that's your retirement, take it and lay it at the feet of God. Because even in your retirement, God still has an enormous calling on your life. And He wants to use it for His glory. Man, we need to teach this to the teenagers, don't we? That are about to graduate. Because God has a specific calling on the life of every single one of those teenagers. He is calling them to do great things for His glory. But so many of them have no direction whatsoever. They're allowing the secular world to tell them the kind of people that they ought to be whenever they ought to be listening to you and me and the church. Grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, teaching them, listening to God's Word, Praying and seeking the calling He has for their life. And so, to Him who knows the good He should do, and does not do it to Him it is sin. There's two quotes from Dan Cathy, but before we get there, I just want to see his, uh, in his secular world, what, how, does, how does Chick-fil-A so successful? Listen to what... Uh, Listen to the uh, kind of the list of what they say. This, this is the way he operates his business. Godly businesses can work. We can do God's will out in a secular world. Climb with care and confidence, he said, number one. Number two, create a loyalty effect. What does that mean? That means that 
the people that are in your company, they want to stay with your company. The people that come and receive your goods and services, they want to come back. So treat them in such a way that they will. Never lose a customer. I mean, that, they will go out of their way. And if somebody starts to argue about a bill or something, which I've never seen happen at Chick-fil-A, they're taught by the Cathy's, this is part of their instruction, that they give, you give them what they want, whatever it is. You know? So you don't lose a customer. Put principles and people ahead of profits. Isn't that important? Now, James is going to talk about that a good bit in here in the last part that we're about to read in just a second. Principles and people ahead of profits. And then number five, closed on Sundays. Why did he decide to do that? Because he said every one of his employees deserves the opportunity to go to church. And we're going to give them that opportunity. And every single one of us have been really, really craving some of that golden brown fried chicken on a Sunday and pulled in the parking lot and went, oh, Sunday. But you know, listen to, listen to his... His statement, though, Dan, uh, Truett Cathy, to God, to, to glorify God, this is a purpose statement of Chick-fil-A, to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come into contact with Chick-fil-A. So just quickly for a second, what is your life's mission right now? What is your mission? What do you believe that God has called you to do? Out there in the marketplace. Now we, every single one of us, our, our ultimate mission is the Great Commission. To make disciples of all nations. Teaching them to observe all that He's commanded. And baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now that's our Great Commission. Okay, but what is your specific mission? What's your calling? Somewhere along the line, I think we've forgotten that Christians are to be salt and light wherever they go. If you go to Walmart, you're representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you go to McDonald's, you're representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're His ambassador on this earth. If you're at home with your family... You are representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you drive down Mobile Highway, you are representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So abide by His statutes. Live in such a way to honor Him. Two more quotes from the Cathy's real quick. We hit it real quick. Yeah, a second. Yeah. It is when we stop doing our best work that our enthusiasm for the job wanes. We must motivate ourselves to do our very best and by our example lead others to do their best as well. You know, when Christians see other Christians, Christians standing up in their marketplace, you're going to motivate other Christians to stand up in their marketplace as well. When you're not afraid to speak the name of Jesus out and about, no matter even if it costs you your job, your livelihood, God's going to replace that. So when you're not afraid to do that, and you do it with boldness, so will your neighbor, so will your brother, or your sister who sees you. And then also, uh, Truett said, I believe that you can combine biblical principles and good business practices. I testified before Congress on how to be honest and successful at the same time. <laughs> Well, isn't that something Congress needs to know? Amen. All right, well, moving on. Um, abides by God's statutes. And then thirdly, godly business. Here's the third A of the triple A of godly business. Accounts to God's scrutiny. In other words, I mean, you're, you're held accountable by God and you hold yourself accountable by God. Ultimately, every single one of us is going to be held accountable to God. But the difference between the true Christian who understands God's principles of godly business, they're holding themselves accountable right now to God. Remembering that, number one, that wealth is passing away. Wealth passes away. And he says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. 
Now, whether that's in this life or the next, all of the things that we've sought after and gathered here on this earth, what's going to happen with them? Peter tells us, he says, one day what's going to happen? The elements will melt with a fervent heat. It's all going to go away. So if you establish your life on things, on material possessions, one day they will all leave you and you will be left empty-handed before God. Whether it happens this side of eternity or not, wealth and possessions can all in a moment be stripped away. They are passing away. And it is when we assign lasting value to temporal things that we miss God's purpose in allowing us prosperity on this earth. Remember what we said Sunday? God blesses us. Pop quiz. God blesses us so that we can bless others. God blesses us so that we can bless others. And so he says... Weep and howl for the misery that's coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Now that's such a vivid picture. What does he say? He's talking about what's in your hand. Now, the word literally means poison. It's corrosion. It's going to poison you. Corrosion is the way it's translated, but literally the word means poison or venom. It's going to bite you, and it's going to sting you, and it's going to kill you. And the, the marks, the rot is going to run up your arms, and all over your body, and all over your face. And you're going to be as rotten as the gain that you've sought on the inside and on the outside, people are going to see it in your life because you've spent all of this time seeking after things that are temporary. You laid up treasure in the last days. You laid it up in the last days. Why? It's at the end. What is it? It's at the end of its uh, life expectancy. It's expiring. Everything on this earth. I mean, I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not like I have. But the expiration date for Allison doesn't really mean much on some things. Now, she's, she's getting mad at me because I shouldn't talk about this in front of her, in front of y'all. But one day, there was a jug of milk that was expired. I didn't pay any attention to it. It was only a day expired, so she thought, okay, it's fine. And then I get that jug of milk out, and I pour it, and I take it, and it's solid. It has substance to it, you know what I mean? It's no longer liquid anymore. It reached its expiration date. Now, she doesn't do that with everything. She's, she's conscientious about all of that. She's excellent, yeah. <laughs> I know, I've seen some of the stuff he's brought over too. It, the expiration date on it. But she, she's a great cook and all of that. She's a wonderful cook. Wonderful. She provides for us. And there's Usually behind that expired jug, there's already another fresh jug. We just hadn't thrown the other one out yet. Um, but anyway, everything on this earth has an expiration date. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suffer for this later. I know I am. I'm going to be in trouble when I get home. I am. I know. Look at her face. It's good to make biscuits. That's what that is in those biscuits. Sour milk. Okay. So, but, all right, we're back on track for a second. Everything has an expiration date on this earth. And what James is saying, it's the last days when James is writing, meaning everything around you that you're, you're seeing, he says, it's getting real close to the expiration date on all that stuff you're hoarding up. Because the Lord's return is imminent. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and all of this stuff is going to melt with a fervent heat. 
If he said that 2,000 years ago, what about today? Aren't we living in the last days right now? We are past the expiration date. We're on borrowed time right now. The Lord is going to come soon and very soon. And everything that we've ever wanted, desired on this earth that's physical, material, is going to go away. And so James says, weep and howl. If that's really who you are, and that's really what you want... Your misery is coming. Wealth is passing away. But then what does James remind us? People, on the other hand, last forever. People last forever. You've laid up treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters you reached have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. He's saying, you've neglected people your whole life. And you've frauded people. The the biggest accusation there is fraud. It's keeping from someone else what is due them. Solomon talks about this in Proverbs. He says, don't let your eyes close before you give what's in your hand to give to the one that you owe. Don't even, don't even let your eyes close. Like you don't, don't take a nap, let alone let the night pass before you give what is in your hand to give. Give it to them. You know, I think about when I read James's words here, I think about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man died. Lazarus died, and then the rich man died. What does that say about us? We're all going to die. And they don't cease to exist, by the way. They're in the presence of the Lord. And so the rich man, he lifts up his eyes and he's in torment and hell, what the Bible says. And he's in anguish. And he says, tell Lazarus to come. Come serve me again. You know, take care of me. Do, do this for me. Do this for me. Me, me, me. Touch his tongue. I touch my tongue with some water and cool it off and... No, there's a great chasm. So let's send someone to go tell about what's coming. What does Moses say to him? He says, in life, you received all your good things. It was all about you, your whole life. On the other hand, Lazarus, he didn't have anything. And now he's being comforted in Abraham's bosom. And so he says, James says, come now you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. And then he says in verse 5, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. In other words, you had it pretty good on this earth, but misery is coming. You fatten your hearts in the days of slaughter. Well, that's a, isn't that an image? I mean, you think about those cows getting fatter and fatter out there eating that grass, corn-fed beef, USDA choice, black Angus steak. And it has no idea what's about, to, what's about to hit it. And he says that's exactly the way the rich, they have no regard for others. That's the way they are. Those who don't submit their business to the Lord and they fraud and they seek dishonest gain, In verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So, ultimately, if the heart strays far enough, you will have so, such a lack of regard for human life, the the fact that human beings last forever and they are more more valuable than anything else on this earth is the brother or the sister next to you, your neighbor down the street, the child in in the mother's womb, what does it result in? Well, it results in a lot, of the thing, a lot of the things that are happening in our society today. We are the most materialistic society on the face of this planet and probably the most hedonistic society that's ever existed. And right now, I believe, this is my, my opinion, you take it or leave it, God is calling us back through all of the things that are happening. With everything that's being stripped away, Piece by piece, he's saying, look, I'm giving you one more chance to get back to me, to come back to me. 
acknowledge me. And for the church, he's saying, walk as men and women of faith in the holy place, on the home front, and out there in the marketplace. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Will you be the one that allows what you really believe and what you affirm right now here in this place to affect what you do out there? Heavenly Father, we submit ourselves to you. We thank you, dear Lord, for your word. And Lord, each and every one of us has dealings on a daily basis with someone somewhere in our lives who doesn't know you. Lord, would you find us faithful, good stewards of everything you give, recognizing that nothing truly belongs to us. Everything that you give us is meant for your kingdom and for your glory. Father, that we would represent you well, ambassadors who spread the good news of Jesus wherever we go and who reflect that reality in the things that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a... Uh, one more verse that we needed to hit that I, I missed. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. That's a great memory verse for you to take home with you. So if you don't know that one by heart already, go home and memorize Micah 6, 8. Be good stewards. God bless you.